You've heard the term, they gave up the ghost. They just abandoned. They've abandoned. The, the place is gone. It's, it's vacated. Ghost towns are places that were once were economically viable and are no longer economically viable. This historian, Steve Arndt, makes the claim that there are 250 ghost towns in Oregon. See, I'm from Oregon, and I had no clue that was a thing. This, the cover shot here, is Whitney. And Whitney is a unique ghost town. Uh, you, Whitney is a mining community without being a mining community. They didn't mine for gold in Whitney. They provided services for the miners in the area. So Whitney was known for its lumber mills. Horses were, would be raised and, and, and cared for in Whitney. So I call Whitney the eight to five workers because they provided all the services and the needs for the miners. So yeah, this valley really is Whitney Valley. Uh, it was where Whitney was settled in 1901. Mm -hmm. I'm just jazzed right now, yeah. honestly. Yeah. I feel almost like overwhelmed by natural beauty. I'm, I'm a young city man. And so I don't get to see this kind of like flora and just this kind of like undisturbed nature. To see the remains of human activity, but to know that like people lived and thrived here once upon a time, a lot of the town isn't here anymore. But yeah. what is preserved is preserved quite well. Are those horses? I, like, I, I, like, I peep livestock. I think so. It looks like we may have an actual human friend. The general store in Whitney is now the caretaker's summer home. And so if you're very kind to this man, he will let you walk around the buildings and he will even take you through what is the old general store today. We just got to talk with uh, our friends who we actually saw the, uh, the smokestack for. Uh, his name was Harold. Harold Maybe. is just absolutely great people. He lives up here in this town and he actually told us this road we're walking on right now at one point in time was Main Street. Harold is like exactly what we were hoping, like the person we were hoping to run into out here. Someone to really help us bring these old buildings to life. That collapsed building we saw on our way in was actually rumored to be where the school teacher lived uh, while she was in town. Sparsely populated does not mean dead. And this idea that this is a ghost town, and it's been a ghost town, but he said that he more or less grew up around here. His dad worked on a ranch here. People have been here, there's been like active individuals living their lives in this space and that's something that I feel like that's really important for us to note mm -hmm. and really that's like very fulfilling to know. So what is rural? I mean I guess that's a, a place to start and rural by definition is is small uh, remote and sparsely settled and and those characteristics of rural places really define their economic role. In Eastern Oregon, we still see a lot of employment is driven by good producing industries, construction, logging, manufacturing, and mining. And these are more of the traditional rural employment. So we started with a natural resource base, and then a lot of rural areas were able to be competitive in the manufacturing much of that manufacturing based on those natural resources, or rural areas became attractive places because of low cost of labor and land. In 1860, Sumter was the largest city in the state of Oregon. There were over 10,000 miners 
in that community. There have been three fires that have d devastated most of the town. You probably saw the, the old bank vault and the mine shaft that still stand. The old hospital, which is now a bed and breakfast, still stands, but most of the buildings are newer, are made to look old, but didn't survive the three fires. For about eight years, until the gold played out, it was a huge community, and slowly people left, fires took their toll, and Sumter is now the size that it is. You know what? I, in my head, kind of had this preconceived notion of the spookiness that is a ghost town. And so far, this experience has very much opened my eyes to the life that surrounds these communities. Sometimes nobody comes all four days, and sometimes I have people. So. Keeps you on your toes. Sumter is really hard to define. Sumter is history, it's mountains, it's trees, it's the quiet. You have to really mean it to be here. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you don't just accidentally drive through on your way to somewhere, unless you're really super duper lost. I moved here when I was one, and I uh, went to college away from here when I was 19. I was in Air Force ROTC, I was studying engineering, and I moved back in 2010. I just was not a small town girl who was getting away from the small town. I was a small town girl who was going out to serve the world at large. We grew up saying our parents were professional volunteers. That's what our family did for entertainment is we volunteered together. I was in 4-H, I was in Girl Scouts. You see, I'd already, already gotten myself into the whole mess of, of trying to do things. We have a, a group called Sumter Valley Community Volunteers. Actually, one of the, our, our big projects, Volunteer Park, was built all with volunteer labor. Yeah, the, the, the passion started here, the pa passion went with me, the passion came back. I think of people a little bit like E. coli. We're here to serve the gut of Sumter. And then we pass. <laughs> we just keep Sumter running and then we pass. And if we're bad E. coli, we pass faster. <laughs> people land in Sumter. And if you stay long term, you're never going to define it. If you stay short term, you're never going to define it. <laughs> Uh, Sumter's special, and it's ephemeral, and you can't put your finger on it, and it suits you or it doesn't. Yeah, it has mountains and it has trees, and so does Montana, but there's just something about Sumter. In Eastern Oregon, we have several counties that are frontier counties. They're the most isolated in the U.S., extremely high distances to markets, which really impacts the economic viability of businesses in those communities and the lifestyles of the people who live in those places. It's challenging, which for people in Western Oregon and in Portland, that's sort of hard to fathom. You know, why would people uh, endure these conditions? You have people who are really committed to that 
lifestyle. And the isolation is actually a huge advantage. What's interesting about those places is they all have interesting histories. Most of them still have a couple of people who are still living in those places and who love those places. And that actually is one of the things about rural places that is, I think, unique, is people tend to develop strong attachments to the land and to the, and, and to the environment of the places that they live. Everybody has what I call their unicorn dream. You know, something they're never gonna see their unicorn, but they have this unicorn dream out there. And for us, when we left here, you know, we always said that our unicorn dream was if, you know, we could return as managers of both the pack station and the lodge here. Um, and one day our unicorn called. We met on a guest ranch in Montana. Um, he was already working there and I went to work as a wrangler there and he was my boss and so that was where we met. Wrangling dudes. We came for the back country, we came for the Eagle Cap wilderness and for its horseback activities and the wilderness and the guiding. Um, and we actually didn't know anything about Old Town Cornucopia as it is now. Cornucopia has the deepest, most expansive underground tunnel system of any mine, mine in the state of Oregon. It's hard to imagine, but some of those mines went back 4,000 feet in the ground. They say there is as much gold yet to be found as there has been found. It's very, very difficult to find and get to. 40 years ago, there were probably 40 buildings that stood Today, I want to say there's five or six that are all that's left from the original building. There are several old cabins that are interesting to see and, and kind of know a little bit of the history on. The jail. <laughs> the boarding house. So a lot of Cornucopia was moved, like I said. Um, when the town shut down, they actually took the buildings down. Um, there's some in Carson and Jimtown and Halfway. All have buildings from Cornucopia down there. Um, uh, they actually would cut them in half and transport them down the hill and, and replace them. So, so a lot of the buildings have been pulled out of there. So anything that's left standing um, is kind of interesting just because it sticks out. People ask all the time, what do you do for fun? What's your recreation? What do you, and it's probably the only job, for me anyway, where I can say that my vocation is my recreation. That's to me what it feels like, is that I don't get up every morning to go to work. For me, it's not, it's not having, it's not having a, a job, if you will, where I gotta punch in, punch out, but it's get up and hmm, you know, something's going to happen today that I didn't expect to happen when I went to bed last night. Northeast Oregon, as I kind of shared already, is kind of a little undiscovered chunk of wilderness in a lot of ways that most of us don't, didn't even know about. If your idea Roughing it is only spending a night in a cabin that has a shower and all the things you want. We'll cook your meals. You can still, I mean, that's that's to tip, you know, put your toes in the water sort of a thing. You may still have to drive all the way over here. We've had many people who were like, wow, I was out on the porch this morning and we saw a fox came by or we saw a bear wandered right by our lodge, which happens here. No troubles, just wandering through. That's that's adventure for that person. That's good enough. Education-wise, um, how do you get people, how do you get them to take that first step to coming to Eastern Oregon, period? As soon as you come over the hill from Richland, you realize, oh my gosh, um, we're coming back.
we need to see these communities continue to adapt. It can be very hard for a single business to stay on top of market trends, to look around and see what's happening nationally and also internationally within my field. Some places, that's a real role for the local government to do that, especially when small businesses, you know, just are really challenged. But in rural areas, local governments are also very challenged. I, I think rural people appreciate urban places because that they get a lot of the things that they can't get in their own hometown in urban places. Um, medical services, legal services, um, some shopping goods that they can't get locally. Urban people often underappreciate their really dependence on rural places. And it isn't just for food. It's, it's more the opportunities to, to get out of the city. R urban people really have a stake in the future of rural places. My job is to educate people on the crazy, weird, wacky stuff that they bypass because people are going too fast. People do come in and try to change it. Oh, we need to be more like sisters. Or, oh, we need to be more like Portland. It's a very slow process to make changes. Mm -hmm. And the people tend to be a bit reticent about changing why they're here. I came for the quiet. I came because this is a healing place. I came because I want the slower pace. If you haven't gotten out and explored and experienced the rur just rural areas where there's ranching and agriculture, um, and yet it's the people on the eastern side of the state that make the decisions that ultimately affect a lot of those rural, or the, the western side of the state, <laughs> that ultimately affect those on the eastern side that are, that are um, providing your food. I need the people from the west side to be as in love with Eastern Oregon as I am, even if they choose not to live here or to quote unquote contribute to the economy, if you will. The benefits to, um, to, to society as a whole of wild areas and rural areas is really being less and less understood. We cannot view these places as separate. If you care about rural America, you have to care about urban America, and you have to look for the connections and ways to strengthen connections that are equitable to rural people and rural places, and you often see those communities in you know, less of a bargaining position, lower resources, so the existing linkages that are there now don't always come out favorably for rural people, but we need to work together. Just because we're really comfortable out in the wild doesn't mean we're comfortable other places. And so for us, it's simply kind of looking at it from the other side, you know, um, just because they're not comfortable here doesn't mean there's something wrong with them or because or we're not comfortable other places where they are. And so it's simply an education and remembering, you know, that we all had to start somewhere. What really makes a difference in the town is the will of the town to thrive and the leadership, the, the existence of, of, of leaders in the town who look for opportunities. The prospect of exploring the parts of the state that I'm led to believe are just like desolate, the middle of nowhere, which I think is a kind of a pretentious mindset. This idea that because there are less people here that it is somehow less relevant or less important or less culturally prominent. That's when Sumter becomes forgotten, is when there aren't people here anymore care.